Good afternoon. My name is Michael Benville. I am uh, here to talk to you about, guess what? NFTs and the metaverse. But to make it interesting, I've asked the bar to bring out shots of tequila. <laughs> and every time I say NFT or metaverse, somebody has to take a shot. Um, and I've been playing for the entire last talk and early this morning, so I'm well soused and ready to, uh, <laughs> ready to talk. Um, I am actually here to, to talk about uh, uh, NFTs and, and the metaverse, um, but I'm not here as a technologist. I am here as a, as a creative. Uh, I'm the founder of a studio at 19th and uh, Broadway called uh, Benville Studios. And for the last 15 years, uh, I have built a team of creative ninjas, a very small group of us, 10 of us, and um, we're an idea manifestation machine. So this afternoon is going to be a short step into my life, call it the last 15 years or so, and why I'm here speaking to you about the metaverse and NFTs. But it begins as a creative, and it's still a creative role for me. Um, the studio started 15 years ago when we began to build one-of-a-kind objects for individuals and families around the world, bespoke objects. We built these things in secrecy um, and, and still do. Um, they could take the shape of consoles or treasure chests or immersive rooms or, you know, a box of keys that would interact with 26 objects or gifts. Something like what the de Medici's in the 21st century would commission from a group. We would build quietly. Uh, and, and really grounded in narrative and all sorts of art and technology. But we use tools that are, you know, uh, four blocks away from here, there's a printing press and a press that hasn't fundamentally changed in a thousand years and, and, and in the last, I think it's 110 years old or something like that and it helps dry the glue. So we actually are making and binding things at the very same time as we are creating digital objects and, and metaverses and, and now NFTs. Um, what started to happen is that we realized that our clients, especially these multi-generational clients, had kids who were interacting with our books but really wanting to pinch the screen and zoom into it. And we started to realize that, like so many of us, that this digital layer isn't really any different than the content that we were creating in our archives. It's just taking a new piece of technology and telling a story with it. So if I was a monk, the new technology is going from you know, paper to vellum or vellum to paper, I don't know which way it went. It's just telling the same story, but in a new, a new way. Another beat in the evolution of the studio was that about seven or eight years in, clients would say to us, well, you've done this wonderful thing for us personally, what could you do for our company? Uh, how would you take our company and, and make it uh, a narrative or a, a, you know, a, a, a story? And that led us to um, amazing projects. Uh, my great friend and mentor, Bob Pittman, who was the creator of MTV and then ran AOL and, and currently runs iHeartMedia, uh, tapped me to build his corporate headquarters when he took over Clear Channel, which is now iHeartMedia. And at the time, I said to him, I'm not an architect. I'm a, I'm a designer. I create things. And he said, I want big, mind-blowing ideas, and we'll pair you with an amazing architect, and, and you'll start to understand uh, what it is we're getting at. So these are these projects we've built out and helped to reimagine the 4 million person visitor experience to the Empire State Building. Uh, we've just opened uh, the bottom frames there, uh, Area 15, which is a 250,000 square foot building in Las Vegas. It opened three days from now, a year ago, right in the middle of COVID. And it's an immersive wonderland of, uh, of, uh, of experiences. I say all of that because I want you to understand that my world is started painting murals in restaurants. It is tactile. It is a world that I build physically. But of course, we've all started to use tools like SketchUp and Rhino and all of these digital assistants and things that allow us to visualize and create the worlds that we are ultimately going to build and, and be in. And these two slides, uh, really are this, this moment in time where I started to understand the metaverse. This is, call it, seven, eight years ago. How long ago was iHeart, Jen? Eight years ago, we built out the corporate headquarters. It was the first time that I'd really been introduced to SketchUp. And I could go to the top of a staircase and see down and see what the reflections of mirrors would be and all of these sorts of things. Uh, a plus I were terrific architects. The bottom row is the built space. The top row is the SketchUp space. And I remember saying to Bob at the time, 
you know, we're going to throw away this model or forget about it because we'll be inhabiting real space. But in, the reality is, is that in a few short years, that digital model will be the boundless expansion of your 75,000 square foot office in New York and the 5 million square feet of offices across the country. There will then be untold millions of square feet of worlds that you can explore that were built by the very same people that built the brick and mortar version of it. Architects, designers, decorators, all of these people are essential to the metaverse. So, right around that time, I began an exploration. I really wanted not just the great technologists, but I also wanted to find the great humanists, you know, the people who actually really cared. Uh, and it led me through my friend Sam Engelbart and, uh, and his partner Mike Novogratz at Galaxy Fund to meeting the extraordinary Philip Rosedale, who uh, created Second Life, which some of you may remember from back in the day. It still exists. There are tens of thousands of people who own real estate there. Philip is an absolute genius. When I met him, he was working on High Fidelity, which was the VR version of uh, Second Life, which he then pivoted into the purely spatial audio version of it. And we'll come back to that audio in just a moment. Uh, then you have Caitlin Meeks and Mackie Duprez, schooled in the world of, of Philip, but also in their own right, have been creating the most amazing uh, VR worlds in, uh, in their, their project Tivoli. Um, absolutely invite you to just go into Tivoli and see uh, the most expansive, gorgeous, textured, layered, wonderful places in which you can, you can meet. And then my friend, uh, Eric Poulier, who is also um, uh, my partner in Vadim Spatial Web. Um, Eric, five years ago, was uh, the person who really sat down and said, this is an NFT. And he minted and made the first NFTs. Uh, he's credited within his circles as, as to doing that. And the name non-fungible token at the time didn't seem to make any sense to anybody. So what they did was they called them VATOMs, virtual atoms. And we'll get back into that in a little bit. So this is what it started to look like at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, we, through Tivoli, uh, with, uh, with Caitlin and, and Mackie, built a scale model one-to-one -one of the studio uh, which is right here again at 19th and Broadway. Um, but we were able to add four screens where there's really one, and we were able to put all sorts of Easter eggs and cookies in, into the thing. Um, the pandemic struck, and our first prototype was out. This was a three-dimensional virtual space that my team and I could meet in as avatars. And you're seeing up in the top right-hand corner my dube scan, which is me going in for 12 seconds, snap, you know, 80 cameras take a picture of you. And then uh, a few weeks later, because they have to animate the, the puppet, uh, you receive your avatar. And the avatar is responding to your VR headset and handles, so I could walk around. Really wonderful little touches, because I realized that I was wearing my father's Tommy Nutter blazer from uh, 19, you know, circa 1981 or something like that, Savile Road jacket. And, uh, and there it was uploaded into the metaverse. Um, because I happened to wear it that day. Not as an NFT and not as anything, just linked to my body. But it will one day also be an NFT. Um, so, in that space, I also realized the power of being in a virtual space. When I could see my, my dog, who I, I lost this year, we, we lost our little uh, Oliver at 15 years old. But I'd go into the VR space and Oliver's there in the corner. And I'm walking through a place that I've been for 11 years. Uh, alone sometimes, or also there with my team, it's a phenomenally interesting thing to be in a virtual space that's modeled on a real space. Because a friend of mine, Eric, was actually staying in town, and he said, you know, I know where everything is. Uh, that's odd. I've never actually been here, but we spent so much time in the VR version that I know where the kitchen is, and where the bathroom is, and where the laundry room is, and all of those things. All right, now, a sobering, but maybe hopefully also inspiring slide. Um, once read this incredible article by uh, Yuval Harari, who is the brilliant author of Sapiens and Homo Deus and 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. Fantastic, fantastic book. Uh, and he wrote this article, The Rise of the Useless Class, which is really sobering. Because if you scan that right-hand uh, column right there, he's, he's predicting where and what industries will be most affected by 2033 and how many of those people will be out of work and effectively replaced by automation or or you know, uh, artificial intelligence. Now, uh, we'll go back, well actually, sorry. I just wanted to touch on one thing there. Um, 
he, uh, he also says anybody who tells what the future is going to look like is a, is a liar. So take that all with a grain of salt. But what if he's half wrong or just a quarter wrong? You're looking at entire industries that then have only 25% of their workforce or even a 25% reduction in any of the workforce would be tough. But he does have this one line where he says, by 2033, many new professions will likely appear. For example, virtual world designers. But such professionals will probably require much more creativity and flexible flexibility than current run-of-the-mill jobs. I suggest that most of the people in this room who consider home and life and layouts and, and how we live and all of those things are really well suited to be part of this conversation. And it's not a scary, scary thing once you dive into it, if you understand that you've already been using the tools to build real world things, and that this is just the digital equivalent of it that will not replace the real world object, it will just have a facsimile of it that also lives in the metaverse and can do wonderful things. So, um, we, and I mean multiple industries that are going to engage in this play space, need to think of ourselves as, as midwives to this process, midwives to building the metaverse, because we've spent our whole life thinking about how people interact and, and are in space and what it means and where something should feel, just, just where it should feel. These are the exact same things that need to be solved in the metaverse. Because if you're in full virtual reality, where to sit and where to go next and where to find something is absolutely critical. And it's not a video game, it's a different sort of, of, of space and language. So architects and designers are pioneers and they will help to define this new design language for the metaverse. And the expanse of that web is going to require an additional layer of navigating information. So we're not just navigating space, we're navigating space and information in the metaverse. So. These are some examples of things that were built in uh, Vatim Spatial Web, which is the, the company that I'm a chief creative officer uh, of. Um, to describe what Vatim Spatial Web does is it is a, a robust NFT minting platform that you don't necessarily need to make them NFTs that is linked to com you know, commerce. Uh, um, you can also just make a digital object. Uh, and we are also the creators of a tool set which allow all brands and all individuals to build their own worlds in a metaverse. So think of us like a WordPress, right? You can go in, in, in minutes and seconds, in fact, you can launch your own place and invite your friends in and be there and, and meeting. And not as an avatar, not as a, uh, as a digital version of yourself, but as your video disc, and you'll see some examples of that. This has been a wonderful uh, year. Uh, in terms of, of, of pushing the envelope of what these spaces could be like and how many people could meet in them. Because most worlds are gated and limited to maybe 50 to 75 people can meet in the space. With Spatial Web and, um, and Vatim, we can have thousands of people meeting in one space. That means that in this room, uh, if you were in a traditional thing like, like Fortnite, you would be split into groups of 100. So there might be 10,000 people there, but it would be 1,000 groups of 100, or whatever the math is on that. The minute there's 101 people, it creates a new instance. Effectively, these columns would divide you. You'd be watching me, you'd be watching me, and you'd be watching me, and all of you would be able to talk with each other, and all of you would be able to talk with each other, but you wouldn't be able to talk to the group next door. If you, if you get, that's how sharding works. So what we've been able to crack the code on is having thousands of people in one space, all being able to walk up to each other and interact and, 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 and work. But this is just a toolkit, right? Uh, so um, some of you may know of uh, New York's legendary Beaux-Art Beaux Ball. Uh, it's a fantastic, uh, you know, for the Architects League of New York, they throw this ball in real life. This year, they couldn't throw it in real life, but they tapped to real-life architects, not, not architects of the metaverse, but real-life architects, Niran Turan of Emma Studio and uh, Kevin Hearth of Kevin Hearth Co., and they created a digital architecture as a backdrop for this annual social gathering. And building within the metaverse gives us these opportunities to bring designs to life that were, were hitherto left on the pages of impossible ideas. These are flights of fancy, you know, they were relegated to science fiction once upon a time. Um, 
Here you can see how information can be navigated. Slack, Pratt University this year uh, did all of their art shows for, um, uh, sorry, the portfolio shows for their uh, students um, were built in spatial web. This is meeting on top of a logo, but off in space. Um, the next slide is um, uh, coming up on the next one. There we go. <laughs> this is Intel hosting simultaneously 70, 70 simultaneous presentations like a trade show where each of the engineers and scientists is sitting at a place, video is playing behind them, and you can walk up to each and every one of them. The next slide is the Cannes Lions Festival. This was 2,000 people uh, simultaneously meeting in one place, all the presentations, all of those things. And the last one is the iHeart uh, CES party this year, had Ryan Seacrest, Dua Lipa, uh, et cetera. And I'm running out of Time. So let's quickly, quickly hit. Um, I think we'll just skip this one. This is just about the difference between virtual reality and augmented reality, which are the lenses through which you access this world. What we are heading to and where we already really almost are, but in the next five years and no more than 10, you will just toggle through whichever reality you need and want to be in. So that means you have your sleeping state, you're asleep, you need no assistance. But you wake up and you're awake. And then you look at your phone. That's a version of looking into an augmented reality, it, it is. But truly, you drink, that changes your state. You put on glasses and then see objects interlaced into the place, that changes your state. And then for full immersion, you go into VR. So the way that it'll affect our home is this. Um, we will have an infinite set of, of, of worlds to build. And, and if you think about a person living in a 500 square foot apartment, this now changes the whole reality of, of how they can live. Because with a set of AR glasses, suddenly those NFTs which were just relegated to your wallet and you know, uh, objects of speculation are something that's actually sitting out in your world. It has a place on a coffee table. It has a place on the wall. It has a place. It's got a reason and a purpose for being in your life. And there are precedents to this. We've done this before. In the 1700s when wallpaper was invented, what happened was that a rising merchant class had the ability to have the things that were only in the rooms of kings and queens. They had murals on their walls and they could achieve them effectively. So that changed what a little apartment looked like. Suddenly it had paintings on the wall and no mural artist had to come in to paint them. That's what these layers are going to mean. And they will interact with the objects in our world. And the last thing I'll say, um, Essence is perception, you know. <laughs> what we see is what we believe. So that's actually something that, um, that is what this is about. It might not be real. You might be able to put your hand through it, but if you see it, you believe it. If it's changing the colors of your wall or the objects that are on your shelf, they're yours. You, you'll see them. And the next slide, please. Vatoms and atoms. We'll get to Vatoms another time, but Vatoms are essentially smart NFTs that can have properties. So. If I'm walking down a city street a la Pokemon and I see a Starbucks coffee on the corner, I can pick it up, I can put it into my wallet. That's a, 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 a Vatom, an NFT now in my wallet. I could pull it off of a billboard, somebody could text it to me. But if I go then later in the day into the metaverse, my studio or something like that, I can open up my wallet within the metaverse and remove the Starbucks that I found on the corner of 19th and Broadway and drop it into the metaverse. And somebody else can come along months later, pick it up and send it to a friend in Tokyo who could take it outside and put it back out on the street or walk into a Starbucks and exchange it for a real Starbucks. So that's going to be the same for a work of art, a book on your shelf, uh, your Prada bag, <laughs> you know, anything will have its digital uh, uh, equivalent. And we have at Vatom this extraordinarily elegant tool for, for minting and be, uh, making these things. And I think, well, yeah, that takes us kind of to the end of it, because I am way out of time. Is everybody nice and drunk? Yeah? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers.